Where Whee! grevilleas grow and basil blooms. It's pollinator week and it's coming to you. Whee! Do they have four wings or do they have two where their eyes are placed? Now that's the real clue. So take a walk, bring a pen when the flowers smell sweet. Who will you meet this pollinator week? Welcome, everybody. Um, attendees and panellists and uh, welcome to this webinar on bee friendly gardening across Australia. What is bee friendly gardening? Why is it important? And how can we do it better? Well, that's what we're here discussing over the next hour or possibly an hour and a quarter, depending on how many questions you're going to have for us. I'm Fiona Chambers and I'm the CEO of the Wean Bee Foundation. And as a charitable foundation dedicated to bees, we support a number of bee related programs. And two of those are Australian Pollinator Week and Bee Friendly Gardening Program, Bee Friendly Farming and Bee Friendly Gardening Program. So we'll be discussing those with you today. Uh, I'm joining you from Gulagin country in southwest Victoria near Colac. And I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And, and also acknowledge elders and First Nations people from each of the regions where you're coming from today. Uh, what an amazing turnout it is today. We have uh, nearly 200 people, just short of 200 people registered for today's webinar from all over Australia, which is an absolute testament to um, not just your interest in, in bees, but also the growing interest generally that we're seeing in bees. Um, of course, that's not just honeybees, it's uh, all bees, and Australia is home to around 2,500 species of native bee. And we've only named and documented around 1,630 of those. So we still have around um, a third of the native bee species yet to discover. And that's one of the reasons why um, Wean Bee Foundation is also supporting the Discover Bees campaign, which is a campaign to discover and document all of Australia's remaining native bee species over the next decade. Um, and thank you to those who, who um, donated today um, and, and whatever donations have come in, we will be putting towards the Discover Bees campaign. So why are we here? Um, well, I think we're here to learn we're here to take action because collectively we can make a positive difference for bees. And that's important because bees, as we know, are keystone pollinators. And not only be, do bees underpin food security, but they're also critical for biodiversity and for ecosystem health. So today is really just a beginning of that conversation. We can't solve all of the problems, but we can take a first step. Um, at the end of today's webinar, we'll be uh, providing a few signposts and providing some information about where you can go to uh, next if you'd like some more information and where there are other free webinars you might be interested in attending through this Australian Pollinator Week. So today we're going to have three speakers for you. They're going to speak for 10 minutes each. And at about the eight minute mark, I'll just jump in and, and give a little knock knock to um, make sure that we're not going over. Uh, and then any questions you've got, uh, we'll have a, a Q&A session at the end. So there'll be a good 20 minutes or so for, for you to ask your questions. So at the very bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a little Q&A tab. And I would ask you in this webinar format, if you would enter your questions in there, I'll make sure I gather those and be directing them to each of the panelists at the end of the session today. So that's what will be happening. Um, I would like to ask uh, our first speaker, Julian, to just turn his camera on and we'll and I'll introduce Julian. Hello. Hello, hello. Hi, hi, Julian. Hi. Now, for some reason, I've got Yolanda having most of the screen. So Yolanda, you might need to unshare your screen. I think you might possibly, I'm not quite sure where you're. Um, Julian, if you just come. Uh, um, I'm not sharing at the moment. Okay, all right. I've got you on the main, you're on the main screen for me. But anyway, we'll see how we go when Julian comes on board. Um, so Dr. Julian Brown is a research fellow in urban ecology at Melbourne University, University of Melbourne. And Julian completed his PhD um, studying the effects of fire on pollinators and pollination. 
He also, was also a research fellow with the Fetter School of Environment and Society at ANU um, and was doing a lot of work with augmenting pollination, uh, crop pollination using native reed bees or native pollinators. So he's really well positioned to be talking to us today about what each of us can do to um, change the environment and improve the environment to support pollinators. So Julian, welcome. Thank you very much for agreeing to um, talk at the webinar today and um, over to you. All right, thank you, Fiona. All right, so today I'm talking from Wurundjeri country in um, Coburg North in Melbourne. And I'm gonna be talking about a research partnership between the University of Melbourne, where I work, and the city of Melbourne. Um, and basically the research is looking at urban plantings for native pollinators, so bees and butterflies, as well as birds. Um, a lot of this work so far has been done by other people, particularly Jess Bowman at the city of Melbourne, um, but I took over a few months ago. Just by way of a background, the, um, the city of Melbourne has this nature in the city strategy. And um, one of their aims is to increase biodiversity and habitats within the city of Melbourne. And they have a target of increasing understory plants on land managed by the city by 20%, which is pretty good. So the city of Melbourne approached the University of Melbourne to help them come up with um, a list of plants, a plant palette that they could plant around the city. They came up with about 80 species, mostly native herbs, grasses, and shrubs. And um, one of the main criteria for selecting species was that they provide resources for bees, butterflies, and birds. So they provide lots of nectar and pollen or larval food for butterflies, nesting material for bees and birds, or protection from predators. <clears throat> and so, a lot of them are native daisies like chrysocephalums and brachyscomb, um, but also things like native bluebells, um, native grasses and shrubs, acacia shrubs in particular. So once they had this plant list, um, they then designed an experiment to test whether these plantings would actually support more bees and butterflies and birds. So um, we started surveying um, uh, animals at these sites before and after planting. So these are before and after photos. You can see before the plants went in, they were just grass or footpaths. Um, and then after planting, they're these beautiful wildflower meadows. So there were four of these impact sites where the native plants were planted. And then um, we have con 12 control sites um, where nothing was planted. So this is just typical you know, lawn, probably with some weeds, overstory trees, um, but the surveys were done at these sites at the same time as the sort of reference sites. <clears throat> um, so far, I've only analyzed the data for the bees, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And um, before I talk about the results, I'll just give a very brief background about native Australian bees. So we have five bee families in Australia. And the family is just a collection of species that are closely related. Um, the five families we have are Apidae, Coletidae, Halictidae, Megachylidae, and Stenotritidae. And Australia is unique in that most of the bee species here are actually within the Coletidae family. They're not the dominant family on other continents. And we're also the only place in the world to have um, the family Stenotritidae. You can roughly divide the native Australian bees into two broad groupings, depending on when they first appeared in Australia. So we've got um, the Stenotritidae and the Coletidae appearing about 70 million years ago, um, while we were still part of the Gondwan and supercontinent, still attached to Antarctica and South America. <clears throat> Um, and then as Australia broke away from Gondwana and started drifting north, we then got all the other bee families, Apidae, Halictidae, Megachylidae, that came in from uh, mostly Asia and Africa. Um, they started coming in about 30 million years ago. So we've got these ancient um, Gondwanan bees and the more recently arrived native bees. Uh, and this is relevant to interpreting the results from this research, so I'll come back to that later. Um, so some of the preliminary findings are, are pretty promising. This is from three years of data. So I've 
um, these two graphs show the data for control sites on the left, impact sites on the right. Um, so the impact sites are where the native plants are planted. On both figures, the vertical axis is a number of bees caught, bee, um, native bee abundance. And on the horizontal axis is the survey year. So first year was before anything was planted. And the second and third survey years, uh, um, years after plantings occurred. And it's pretty clear from these figures that um, at the control sites, there's been no increase in native bee abundance through time. Um, but at the impact sites, we put these native plants in, there's been a dramatic increase in the, um, the number of bee individuals. So native plantings increase the number of native bee individuals. It's a pretty similar story when you look at native bee species. <clears throat> um, so again, control sites on the left, impact sites on the right. Um, if anything, there's been a small decrease in the number of bee species at the control sites. Um, through time, but at the impact sites, there's been an increase in the number of bee species. So native plantings um, are supporting more bee species, um, which is great. So when we were catching these bees, we weren't catching them in traps or anything. Um, we were collecting them off flowers. So we knew which flower each bee specimen um, was visiting. And that's allowed us to make these um, plant pollinator interaction networks, which is what this diagram is. Basically, each box at the top represents a bee species. Each box at the bottom represents a plant species. And a line connecting a bee species to a plant species indicates that we found that bee visiting that plant. <clears throat> the, the width of that line indicates how frequently we saw that interaction. Um, and the width of the boxes is the relative abundance of these species. And I've color coded the species um, by um, their time of arrival in Australia. So the, the blue boxes for the, the bees and the plants, they're the Gondwanan species that have been here for 70 million years plus. The black boxes are the more recently arrived species. And then the, the red boxes for the plants are basically the weeds that came with Europeans. So we can compare these interaction networks um, at the control sites and the impact sites. Um, and so the first thing you notice is that obviously there's more, there are more weeds at these control sites or more of the visitation is to weeds. Um, but interestingly, um, the a higher proportion of the bees we found at the control sites uh, were these ancient Gondwanan bees. Um, so the bees that have been here longest uh, these are the blue boxes. And when you look at what they're visiting, they're actually almost exclusively visiting ancient Gondwanan plants. And so these are the street trees that were already there. So eucalypts, um, callistum and the bottle brush, these sorts of things. Um, but that's not to say that the, the native wildflower plantings we've done aren't um, beneficial for bees. If you look at the... Wallenberger, this native bluebell here, and it's kind of hard to tell from these network diagrams, but it's actually <clears throat> being visited by more bee species than any other plant, whether it's an ancient Gondwana plant recently arrived or a crop. So it's really good for bees and it's, it's being visited by more recently arrived bees and these ancient Gondwana bees. And, um, and some of these bees are pretty much only visiting Wallenberger, so they're probably specialists on this species. So I guess the most important take home message from this research so far is that um, we've found this native herb that's really, really good for native bees. Um, the native bluebell supports uh, a big diversity of native bees, including lots of specialists, which is, which is pretty cool. And I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. That was that was fantastic. It was nice and short and sweet, and I didn't even get to give you your two minute warning. So um, <laughs> you're doing well. So I think we'll have lots of questions for you. Um, that information is is so incredible because one of the things that we've been saying with um, our push for bee friendly farming, bee friendly gardening, is that if you plant a greater diversity um, of plants, that you'll get you'll lead to an increased number and diversity of pollinators, and that's certainly what your your um, research is starting to indicate. So that's great to see.
So thanks for that. Um, I'll get you to turn your camera off now and I shall invite Robbie to come forward. And please um, start putting all of your questions. I'm sure there's gonna be lots of questions that you've got for Julian from that presentation. Um, it's really just a starting point to try and pr prompt your questions to come in. So start populating your questions. And um, I'd like to now introduce Robbie. Robbie, you're going to need to unmute yourself so that you can talk. Um, Robbie is an agricultural teacher um, from the James Ruse Agricultural High School in New South Wales, just out of Sydney. And Robbie's really passionate about education and all things bees. Uh, is one of our very early bee friendly gardening members. And we just thought it was such a fantastic story to share with you, to ask Robbie to share uh, her story about um, bee friendly gardening at a school and how Robbie uses that in her educational day-to-day um, -day teaching to, to engage with students. So welcome Robbie, thanks for coming on board and joining us today for the webinar. So really keen to hear your story about bee friendly gardening at James Roos. So, um, yes, thank you for listening to me. I'm situated at the moment on Darug country, so we all get to know our Aboriginal place names. And this opening slide, I just wanted to have it there because it shows a European honeybee and a little tiny native tetragonula bee. And so many people say, oh, they can't exist together, but there they are on the same plants foraging together. So the background to our school is we have quite a few eucalypts and deji plots and our trees are varying ages because the school had some original trees, some planted trees, and they're getting differing ages at the moment. Since I've been at the school and I've been there for six years, we've lost over 50 trees. Now, admittedly, one set of trees was a Pinus radiata plantation, which had to be got rid of, but others have just been dying from falling over and causing damage. So we're lucky enough to also have a big dam, which we can use for watering the pastures, but it's great for our pollinators. And you can see we've got cattle and sheep, veggie plots, and some little striped marsh frog, frogs appear sometimes. We also have our own apiary. So the Langstroth boxes that you can see there are the Parramatta Bee Club. They're their boxes. They actually base themselves at James Roos and they're really handy for us as a school. They give us so much of their time. But the flow hives are mine. And whenever you're doing a um, look into the bees, then you get the cows coming up to see what it is that you're actually doing. They're very, very interested in bees. Now, this always amazes me at how many different types of things are pollinators. It's not just the bees and certainly not just the European bees. And I only had two minutes the other day and the four pictures on the left there, you've got a bee, some flies and a beetle, all there in that one time. Now, if I'd had more time to look around, I don't know how many other pollinators that uh, you would find. Then we've got our ladybugs and butterflies. We've got a few other flies. I do like the top left picture, uh, not actually a pollinator, but accidentally some animals and creatures can be pollinators because sometimes they might either provide the food for pollinators or they're being chased and accidentally pollinate. Um, so that little fly there's found some food to eat. Other insects, crickets, um, oh, and accidentally, for those of you that were paying attention, I only just noticed there, uh, stuck some spiders in there. Oops. Um, and then we've got more insects here and the kids always laugh. So often when you go to take a picture of small insects, they're busy making new insects as in the case here. Um, this is just Penny the phasmid that we found on the farm one day. She stayed with us and even when the children were doing their exam, she was around. She doesn't do a lot of pollinating, but she creates a lot of babies. But we didn't get a chance to experience them because with COVID, we had special people who came through and cleaned each of the classrooms. And I came in one day and she was dead. And all we could think of was that she'd been accidentally sprayed. Uh, I seem to have got madly in love with this striped marsh frog, but also different spiders. 
The spider on the right is really cool, makes a huge, big, like a dilly bag type um, egg basket. And on the abdomen, it looks just like a little face. But our European honeybees are the biggest pollinator in our gardens. And, but they still pollinate all sorts of different places from our fruit trees, the orange trees, to our macadamia trees, uh, which is the center one there, beautiful blossoms. And then your more usual sunflowers and eucalypts and bottle, bottle brushes and calistamine. Um, here's a few more of our trees and a herb. And here's a different macadamia set of flowers and pig face and bottle brushes. Now these two girls, in fact the whole class, they're actually propagating for more bushes and grasses for us to be planting. So they're planting um, seeds for the grasses and taking cuttings to, for our um, bushes. But the other thing we like to do is to let some of the veggies go to seed because the, any pollinator absolutely adores um, the, especially the pollen and bees need a lot of variety of pollen. It's being thought of now that where you have your huge monocultures and having the only the one type of pollen that that makes the bees are not as healthy as they should be if they had the full variety and balance of nutrients. So these are radishes that went wild and some broccoli. But weeds are equally as important, um, usually introduced, but they also provide wide varieties of pollens and sometimes nectar. You can never have too many weeds. And look, we have even more. We're full of weeds on our place. With our year sevens, this is when the Parramatta Bee Club helps us out a lot. They organise to have a hive of young bees up where we are. So all of the big bees that usually would be out foraging and would sting if they got touched, they've all gone back and we just have a hive of young bees only. So the kids can get up really close and see the brood and see the pollen and see the nectar and then see the capped honey. And that's absolutely amazing for them. Most of them have never seen it before and probably will never see it again. The girls at the bottom are looking at a queen bee in her little queen um, cage and then after that look at this each of these kids is holding a live bee they just couldn't believe that they were doing that that is so cool for them to be able to see a live bee in their hands and then they go off to the whoops I've moved my thing oh, I missed it Sorry, people. Okay, then they went off to the uh, extraction room and learned how to decap the frames and extract the honey. And the two girls on the right are uh, getting to taste some of the honeycomb. We sometimes have swarms and looking at the top two pictures, that's a swarm around a pump. And I've just put that into a nucleus and given that to a member of our bee club. But the huge swarm you can see below was easily four times the size of that small swarm there. And you can't quite see them, but in the middle photo to the left of the girls up near the buildings is the rest of the class. They weren't brave enough to come down and stand with those girls and me in the swarm, but it's a pretty cool feeling. Uh, this is the flow hive. So it looks a little different from a normal hive and the honey flows out into the bucket below. Bees sometimes land on it or get greedy and try to drink from the um, tubes. And this is one of my students who really wanted some honey now. So we filled up her jar and um, it does look beautiful. We also have some native bees and you can find them in so many places. This was a tree that fell down and broke one of our um, fences. Once it was cut away from the fence, then we saw that indeed there were native bees in there. That's a European bee uh, just in that little hole, but the native bees kept it away and they're still happy up there. Each year, I uh, try to split a hive for one or two classes of native bees so that they can see 
the real difference between that spiral look of the tetragonular native bee and the frames of the um, uh, European bee and the fact that where they store their honey and the uh, pollen is totally different and they all get to taste how different the honey is as well. These, I've been putting uh, polystyrene, which I know is not a friendly option. I'm going to have to change it now. That was working very well for 15 years. But this year, you can see on the right what the cockatoos have learned to do. And with cockatoos, if one learns to do something, they pass that information on to all the rest. So each of my native bee boxes was totally destroyed. So they now are naked boxes and I have to work out a new system before the weather gets too warm. So now we've got our little tetragonular carbonaria bees. They also like radishes that have been left to go to flower and eucalypts and pig face. Oh no, these are other natives. So here, this little one and the one in the top right, they're the blue banded bees. And I've forgotten the names of the others, but there's one, two, three, four different types of native bees just there at the school. Corn self pollinates, but this is really good for the kids to see to understand a bit more about why pollination is so important. It's because the pollen from the tassels of the corn fall down onto the soft, loose little silks of the corn. Now, each single silk follows all the way back down to be a kernel for the corn. And if you find you get a cob of corn that is missing, there's a hole where there should have been a nice, plump, juicy kernel, then that's because that particular silk didn't get any pollen. So you can see in the um, picture at the bottom, this poor little cob missed an awful lot of pollination, but it brings it home to the kids how important pollination is. And then we harvest the corn and we top and tail it and sell it uh, as chemical free to the school. We also have a stack of birds, some of which do pollinate, some don't do so much, but a huge variety in just one place in the middle of the city and ducks, swallows, this swallow knocked itself out. It's the only reason I got a chance to finally take a picture because they just move so fast. Um, and the fact that we've got this picture of the um, rainbow lorikeet where you can see that little fan tongue that just is able to suck up and grab all the nectar so well. We also had Lori, who was a baby lorikeet that we kept for quite a while until she grew up. And finally, she flew away a couple of times, came back to visit us for a few weeks, and then we haven't seen her since. But she'd come down, play soccer with the kids and so on. So she was fun. We have stacks of cockatoos, hence they've got their own space to themselves. So they're very good at finding anything with a seed and cracking it open, as well as they'll just come to the corn and snap it just for the fun of it, which is why the corn is now in that huge um, uh, protected netting because the cockatoos were destroying the crops all the time. They do like holes and they love trees. So you can see peering down, what's in that hole? Oh, I'll find out. So they're quite cool. Um, but the cockatoos and the galahs were having a few fights. They were looking for nesting habitats and we were really, really suffering in regards to that. And this is the same tree, but at different times where they're trying to be each other to the nest. And our farm manager even said she saw one day that a cockatoo took a fledgling uh, rainbow lorikeete out of the nest and dropped it 40 metres down. We kept it alive for a, a couple of weeks, but it didn't last, unfortunately. But then we had a tree fall down. So you can see how huge that tree was. That was three of its limbs that fell. You can see in the um, main area, the top picture there, there's still a fair bit of trunk and one limb but it was so riddled with rot that the school said, no, we had no choice, it had to be cut down. And you can see just a few of the uh, grubs that were inside that trunk. And in the, very, oops, in the very top right of that picture is how the tree had looked not long before we lost it. So because of that, we started planting trees. Now this little creek is where all the water comes down 
to our dam and to the main um, waterways bottom of the farm. So it had the creek had lots and lots of old willows and rubbish and junk, etc., in it. So the farmhands cleared that all out, cleared off a nice flat section, fenced it so the cattle could no longer get there and damage the banks of the little creek and so on. And then the kids have planted now a whole stack of eucalypts, bottle brush, grasses, shrubs, and so on. So we're hoping for that to come on soon. Um, about, another, about another minute, Robbie. Okay, I'll go quickly. This is our peach tree area, which we wanted to make more sustainable. So we now made it a drip irrigation area. But as you can see, the kids help on every aspect of that. They help with the blossom thinning, and then they help with the harvesting and the eating, which they're very good at. Same with our oranges. They help with picking, they juice it, they understand what's happening there and drink it. We've got different fruit trees, our native ones, as well as the mulberry. And thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for that, Robbie. That was just so incredible to see all the work that the kids are doing. Um, it's so inspiring. And of course, you know, when we talk about bee friendly farming or bee friendly gardening, um, you know, you, it's very hard to talk about just one species alone because there's so many different, so many different species of bee, but then what you, you're talking about an ecosystem. And so of course, what we're doing to help the bees is also helping other insects and other birds as well. So, um, so that was fantastic to see that, that full picture. I'm going to ask Yolanda to come up now. So Yolanda is, um, the Bee Friendly Farming um, Program Development Officer for the Bee Friendly Farming Program. And Yolanda is a PhD candidate with the uh, University of Sydney. And um, she's studying plant, plant bee interactions, insect, insect plant interactions. So she brings fantastic skills to the Bee Friendly Farming Program. And so Yolanda, would you like to share with us um, what you're doing? There we go. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, yeah, I'd like to acknowledge the land that I'm meeting from today, which is Darawal country in um, Illawarra in so-called New South Wales. And yeah, as Fiona's mentioned, um, I'm a PhD candidate. And through that, when I heard about the Bee Friendly Farming Program, I was really interested. And then when a position came up, I was even more lucky to be able to continuously working with um, growers and gardeners to promote pollinator health and to learn about what we can do to aid our pollinators. Now, before we start, I would just like to um, acknowledge all of the partners that are part of our program. And, whoop, there we go, apologies. Um, so if we sort of put ourselves a little bit in the context of seeing Australia um, under the land management classes that we currently have, we can see that a huge amount of land is currently under agricultural production. But then when we also think about placing us, so the, the huge proportion of different people that are living in Australia now, we are quite an urbanized country. And this is sort of the greater Sydney area that I find myself in. And when you look at it, it's sort of this red color of intensive land use. But as we've seen, and what we've also heard today from our two other speakers, within those really urbanized landscapes, we still have a majority, we still have a variety of different gardens and green spaces that we can work on and through that promote, um, promote habitat and flora resources to a variety, variety of insects and other animals as well. And when we look at both the agricultural and then more sort of the private garden sectors, this is really where the membership program of Bee Friendly Farming falls in. So on the one hand, what which, which we can see in the middle is the Bee Friendly Farming Certified. So this is really for commercial landholders that are producing from the land and then get a certification for the land that they're managing and through that products that come out can be certified. Now it's really exciting that since the launch of Bee Friendly Farming in Australia, which is only six months ago, um, around 11,000 hectares have already been certified under Bee Friendly Farming and another 18,000 are currently under review. 
And I just realized that I have not mentioned it before, but just so you know, the bee friendly farming has, was originally, has originally started in um, America and has been going there really successful for a number of years. And then the Wean Bee Foundation joined into this program together with Pollinator Par Partnership to now launch it within Australia. There's also a Bee Friendly Partner Program. So this is for entities that don't have access to their own land, but wanna support the program. For example, we've had a, some beekeepers that came into the Bee Friendly Farming at it, be friendly farming overall in this way. But really what we wanna look at today is the bee friendly gardening aspect of it. So what falls under bee friendly gardening? This is really about the non-commercial side of land management. So this includes our home gardens and this can be large acreages for some of the more rural properties that some of you might find yourself on, but this can include really small gardens as well. I myself find myself in, um, rental properties throughout the last couple of years of going through uni but everywhere I go I sort of create a little garden often growing veggies and a bunch of different flowers and this sometimes goes straight into the ground or it can just be in pots as well and then within that of course we have this beautiful variety of community gardens that we find in um, our ur more urban and or sometimes also some rural areas as well and as we heard from Robbie school gardens are really also a beautiful way in which we can create um, a sanctuary for biodiversity, but also an education tool set as well. And then we have public gardens as well. And this is really, so bee friendly gardening can also be used under public gardens that are used in a non-commercial setting. Um, I thought I'd briefly sort of also talk about what it actually is that bee friendly farming looks at. So what are the guidelines that we, look at when we're assessing properties to see if they're fit to fall under the bee-friendly farming. And this really stems from the two sort of major um, areas or threats that have been found by scientists all around the world that are leading to a decline of biodiversity in a variety of different insects, including our flower feeding and pollinating insects. And this on the one hand is the loss and fragmentation of um, native habitats, but it's also the use of agrochemicals. And I feel like both those things we often associate with our agricultural areas, but it's really important for us to see that in the areas that we live, may they be urban or rural, there's often been a huge loss and fragmentation of native habitat and agrochemicals are often still used also in a home setting or being used by, um, by councillors, et cetera. Et cetera. So when we look at what can be classified as bee-friendly farming, we really take these two things into account. So on the one hand, that we establish and conserve um, foraging habitat for bees and the whole diversity of different insects. And again, this could be large or this could be small, depending on what where you find yourself in. And then it's really about also practicing what we classify under integrated pest management. And if you want to learn some more, there'll be a really great free webinar from Paul Horn coming up as part of Pollinator Week that I think we should all go and listen to. Um, what I briefly wanted to touch on about though, when we look at the establishment and when we look at setting flowers aside for pollinators, this really falls into the integrated pest management as well because we're creating floral resources and habitat for beneficial predatory insects as well. And this is just some pictures that I took during my studies um, of a beautiful hollow hoverfly and a lady beetle. So the Bee Friendly Program is really about a recognition and engagement and support of its members. And through that, I feel that building these members, building us, building us up as a community to protect pollinators and a whole suite of other insects that, that rely on floral and habitat resources we then through that can support each other, supporting that whole beautiful biodiversity that we, that we have and that we heard from Julian about that vast majority and learn about what are the kind of flora resources that we should be looking at to be able to target both the diversity of different species, but also some of our rarer species that are much more specialized on particular food sources.
So how do people or how do you sign up if you're interested to join the program? So if you go on our website on the Be Friendly Farming, you will see um, the three different sort of memberships that I talked about, the partnership, the certification, and then the gardening. And if you yourself or a part of a garden that falls under non-commercial um, entity, then you can go on the Be Friendly Gardening application. And through that, we ask questions about the kind of garden that you have or are part of, the bee and foraging resources that are found within that. Um, if you have bees yourself, then we also ask some questions on bee management. And then we ask you about how you manage pests. Because as I said, a really critical element for us in Bee Friendly Farming is learning about pest management as well because of the impact that this has on insects. And here's also my email address, info at beefriendlyfarming.org.au. So if you have any questions or are unsure about what membership might suit you, then please feel free to flip me through an email and that's also found on our website. Um, I'm also really excited to announce that as part of Pollinator Week at the moment, if you sign up under Be Friendly Gardening, um, you can go in the draw of winning one of the beautiful signs. So this is the sign that you can display on your garden to show that you're part of Bee Friendly Gardening and also a beautiful hat, which I'm sure we will all need, although we're looking at a more rainy summer ahead. Um, and with that, I'm really excited to um, bring it back to Fiona for question time. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Yolanda. And if we can just bring Robbie and Julian back to the front. So we'll have all of us live to answer people's questions for the next 20 minutes or so. Now, Julian's been very busy answering the questions. So he's, there's, that's gonna be less to, to, um, to ask because you've been so efficient at answering all the questions online, I think, um, Julian. Can, can someone tell me in the audience, can, can everybody see the questions that, that have been answered or not? Can I have someone in the chat just say, give me a thumbs up or yes, if everyone can see that because I'm not, quite sure hang on a minute let me just see yes no not everybody can yes no amanda can't but everybody else can okay all right i've got some questions anyway so i'm going to um thanks everyone for interacting so well on the q a um i've got some i've been trying to capture all those questions to ask so i'm going to start with julian um can you tell us about what the, the two or three highest performing, um, most bee popular native or non-native plants were that you found, bearing in mind this is for Melbourne, um, and maybe have a comment about if there are any generalizations for other parts of Australia. Yep. Um, so the number one performing plant um, or plants were species from the Wallenbergia genus. So these are the um, native bluebells. Um, they're you know, herbs that grow to maybe 30, 40 centimetres high with these light blue um, or mauve flowers. Uh, they're actually found across a large area of Australia, right up the east coast, even into the arid areas um, on the west coast. They're pretty widespread. And um, since we've been finding a lot of bees visiting them with our research, I've looked into, you know, whether this is a common thing in the literature. And it seems that they are, they're pretty good for bees generally. Um, so they'd be my number one, Wallenbergia species, the bluebells. Um, number two, with the plants that we've been planting, um, some of the native daisies, the um, brachystome species in particular, so the cut leaf daisy is a, is a pretty common one. And we find, we do find lots of native bees on that, um, not, the ancient Gondwana bees, but a lot of the, the recent bees um, and from different families from Helictidae, Megachylidae, um, so they're pretty good. So they'd probably be my two top picks from, from what we've been planting in Melbourne. And so to follow on from that, two other questions, how uh, are they equally attractive to European honeybees and native bees? And the second part to the question, how easy are these plants to access from nurseries? Um, so to answer the first part of that question, um, the honeybees do visit um, these Wallenbergia and the Brachyscombe, but um, they don't seem to be the preferred flowers for the honeybees. The honeybees um, are often going for the big showy things with, with lots of nectar, um, so grevilleas and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of accessing them, um, I know you can get 
um, definitely get bluebells, the wallen birds, yeah, from um, most nurseries that, that stock native plants. I've, I've bought them as tube stock before from a few nurseries in Melbourne. Um, and the brachyscum species as well, yes, because they're quite, they're quite widely planted. So they should be accessible from most native plant nurseries. Great, thank you. Um, Robbie, I'll ask you, whereabouts, um, whereabouts do you get information about what to plant um, with the revegetation? So where do you source that sort of information? There's quite a lot of questions coming through about where to find the information. Where have you found that information from? I've used council an awful lot to see what was in the area beforehand so that we're planting things more like that. Um, and then also, just going online by people who've done it before. We're talking about the Sydney Basin. So what are the main things that still will grow in those areas? But all of the councils are really good. They all usually keep tube stock of whatever is native to there. And we grow it, we usually water it, and then it lives. And we, we know we're not gonna get everything surviving, but uh, we still just go back and get more again. So the council's our main one for their background, but then there's, an, as I say, there's an awful lot online and we get the kids to look up as well and see what should be planted for around that area and so forth. So they're going online to check out um, things that have been done before. And that's consistent with some of the comments coming through. I see a comment someone had put up that um, some of our larger hardware suppliers should be providing cheaper plants for people to make it easier to um, supply. And then other people saying, well, they find the council, um, you know, nurseries are mm. actually a really good place to go to, to be able to get plants. Um, Yolanda, on the, the diversity of plants to plant, you've got a background working with Greening Australia and working on farms and looking at um, different plantings. Have you got any view about what people should be looking to plant in a general sense? Yeah, I think I think it's it's always that thing of like looking at what what is what actually grows well in your area as well. So getting you might you might have like different things that you look up and they really look really interesting. But they might be really difficult once it actually comes and working with greening is straight on planting trees, you know, then things don't always go the way they go. And some things seem to, some things go better when they're actually grown closer together and other things further apart. But then also looking a little bit of how long are you going to wait until you get a return in terms of floral resources. So eucalypts are beautiful trees, but especially when I was living down in Tasmania, you might have to wait a really long time before you get a floral return. So sort of also implementing, like still putting them in, but giving some understory species a go that you have a much quicker return in terms of the floral resources and also the growth and sort of the display that you might be getting. And then when it comes down to, of course, looking more at your private garden, you might not have the sort of space for it as well. But I think most places, have a really good, some native nursery as, as well. Like I know that in um, the Sydney area, I think it's called Indigo Seed. So it's sort of like not always just looking at the hardware shops and, and, the, and those revenues because they don't also, because another element I guess is looking at getting your seed source from a localized area. And so going to your native suppliers and, and botanical gardens is another way that you can often access um, seeds and plants from there to plant them out but yeah often I, I guess with gardening we all know it having a go at it <laughs> is Rami also a good way to go so we've we've talked a lot we've had a number of questions around plants and talked about pollen and nectar and those requirements for bees but what about the actual habitat element so not just food to eat but a place to live um, we saw in Robbie's pictures a whole lot of trees and the whole large trees which were homes for birds but what do we need to do to provide homes and habitat nesting habitat for bees in our gardens so perhaps i'll go to julian whether you've got a comment on that to start with yeah sure so um, most native bee species actually nest in the soil so having access to soil is important um, some of those soil nesting bees prefer just completely exposed soil. Some prefer to be nesting you know, under some light vegetation. 
different species like different soil types, some like standier soils, some like clay soils. Um, but then we do have a lot of species that nest above ground in cavities and, um, and uh, dead plant stems. So I've done a bit of work out um, in the Yarra Valley region, east of Melbourne. Um, and out there, we had quite a few species of native bees, um, particularly Exoneura species. Um, these are the reed bees uh, that nested um, within the fronds of tree ferns. Um, that was sort of their main natural nesting resource. But we actually also found them nesting in um, the pruned cane stubs of um, cultivated raspberries or blackberries. Um, and this is actually something we're trying to look into for the future research project is how you can manage um, native rubus crops, raspberries and blackberries as nesting habitat for these native reed bees, um, which are, you know, they're otherwise scarce in agricultural landscapes where the forest has been cleared and you've often got pasture or annual crops or, or that sort of thing, um, their, their nesting resource has been diminished. And so these- so what, so what would you say is the practical application then for people with a back garden, given that, that bees might nest in, some nest in the soil and some nest in, in, in cavities. So what does that mean for the person with a back garden? How can they make their back garden more habitat friendly and other- Yeah. Where's so, mulch, mulching, for example, come into that? Yeah. Exactly. So that, that's a big one. So um, yes, you know, mulch is good, obviously, um, particularly, you know, in the, the southern summer here where things dry out a lot, but try to have areas that aren't covered in mulch, try to have some areas of exposed soil that bees can access. Um, here in Melbourne, um, I've been finding native bees nesting in areas of exposed soil in my backyard. Um, and then for the, the above ground nesting bees, of course, there are the, the bee hotels. Um, but, you know, if you've got a space to play around with growing some raspberries or blackberries. You could also try creating some nesting material that way. Um, but yeah, having some exposed soil is probably a pretty important one because that is a rare resource in the urban context, at least because, you know, we have tar and concrete everywhere. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the public gardens are mulched and there's just not that much access to exposed soil. So that's an important one for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, did you, any, uh, Yolanda or Robbie want to have a, a Quick comment on that, or are you happy with that answer? No, Julian said it all. But the only thing I did had wanted to say beforehand is I'm so pleased with his research because it makes it look all of the planting and things that we've done is going to really be the idea. Because before, all everybody used to do was plant trees, plant a tree, plant a tree. There was wasn't that extra stuff of the understory and the grasses and that whole process. So I'm really excited to see that information, Julian. Yeah, watch watch this this place. We want to see more of it. We want to see the, the results as they go on, Julian. Um, there's a couple of questions coming through, I can see, around chemicals. And of course, people are always concerned about the impact of chemicals, uh, pesticides being the, of course, the, the biggest one because they're targeting pests and, or insects. Um, and bees are an insect, so they're highly toxic to bees, um, but also um, herbicides as well and surfactants. So um, it, perhaps I'll ask, um, I might ask Yolanda whether you want to uh, have a, a, just a, a, a short answer on that, because this, this obviously it's an issue. It is an issue. How, do, how does the Bee Friendly Farming Program tackle um, chemical usage? That's probably the best way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. I think it 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 really yeah. I think it really stems from the fact of um, when we when we look at when we talk about this integrated pest management. One of the key things I think is monitoring and seeing seeing what's going on. And I think it might need to explain what it means because I don't think a lot of people would understand necessarily. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. So instead of I guess it's instead of having an approach where you spray you spray out because you you heard that that's a, that's a, you're growing a certain things, you might have these certain crops, so you're going to be spraying them out or you might be just blanketly spraying out your weeds and things that you find within, within a certain area. And instead of that, you, you move away from that and you say, no, we're actually really having a look what's actually going on within our landscape, having that sort of more holistic approach of seeing like, what are the different insects? What are the different things that we're finding? 
and then only really going into potentially using a chemical when it's the last resort or it's something that really in the long run will benefit the whole system. When you look at ec ecological restoration, for example, there's a small amount that herbicides are used, but they're really just to get that clear cut. And as I said, it's so difficult sometimes getting native vegetation into the ground to be able to compete against the often really thick weed mat that we find. So I think it's like not, not seeing, like so, sort of seeing it exactly why, why would you be using a particular thing? And if there's really a justifiable aspect of like, well, what I'm going to create is going to create this whole sweep of biodiversity, then it's, it can be justified of using it. So I think it's sort of that, and that's the bee-friendly farming approach as well, sort of really understanding of, well, why is something used? And is there a justifiable reason that for some, in some aspects, we're still relying on this thing. So then we can create a system where we don't rely on it anymore. And I feel that's sort of where the bee-friendly farming standpoint is. So if, if people are interested in more information around um, non-chemical non management of weeds or, um, or pests, there's an IPM webinar, free IPM webinar, Integrated Pest Management, so managing pests in Australia in farm or garden, um, and that's being run by Dr Paul Horn, who is a, a, a pest management specialist who's been working for the last 35 years or so in this field. So he's doing a free webinar and he's going to provide lots of information about all the alternate ways that you can manage pests in your garden um, without just jumping straight to the chemical, chemical jar. Um, so there's a couple other questions around the nesting habitats of bees. So um, Rachel's asking what kind of, this is probably one for you, Julian, what kind of exposed soil? Should it be on a slope? Should it be flat? Um, you know, should it be loose, sandy or hard? Can you give some generalisations there? Um, no, I can't give generalisations <laughs> uh, for two reasons. First, because um, the nesting preferences of soil nesting bees in Australia are really poorly studied. Um, but then the information we do have suggests that different bees like different conditions. So, um, yeah, having a, a slope is often good, um, but not all bees require or prefer a slope. Um, you know, aspect um, is important. Basically, work with what you've got, or if you've got enough space, try to create variability in the conditions. So you create a, a greater diversity of potential nesting substrates for different bee species. Um, but yeah, I guess we're sort of a, ha not having that knowledge kind of means we have this exciting situation where people can just experiment and see what happens and, and learn from that. Thank you. I just might make a comment as well. It's sort of like the frogs where you build a pond and eventually they will come when the condition's right. Now, my blue band of bees, they love being under my back veranda. So the back veranda is raised, there's dry soil underneath, and they have great fun in there. They're nowhere else in the yard at all, only under that area. And where the others are, I have no idea. I just see them, but I don't see where they come from. Yeah, it, it's part of the big issue of us really not, not knowing enough about our native bee species, which is why we need to do so much more work on discovering and documenting, because you can't save a species if you don't know what it is or where it lives or what it eats. Or, so there's a lot we need to learn. Um, I, I want to just a couple more questions. Um, somebody's asked, can I have a plant list uh, in each state? And um, so that's from Jenny. And look, at the moment, um, I would just say that the Wien Bee Foundation is working really, really hard on producing bioregional planting guides across Australia. We've got uh, funding to develop uh, 30 bioregional planting guides. We've published eight so far, and we've got another four that we're releasing this week for Australian Pollinator Week, and they'll be released. They're for New South Wales. This, the four being produced are for New South Wales. Um, we've got one for Kangaroo Island that'll be produced, that'll be published in the next week or two. So that's another five guides and we'll have 30 before the end of the year and we're doing more and more of those. So they're available for free from the Wien Bee Foundation website. So I'd encourage you to go and have a look at those um, and you, you just look up powerful pollinator guides. 
So uh, if you haven't, if, jump on to one of the webinars on the 17th or 18th this week to have a look at those and find out. That's, uh, and they're all based on native, native plants that are indigenous to the bioregion. Um, okay, another one, I want to go, Robbie, for you, with your school, um, do the students, um, how, easy, how easily do your students understand the link between pollinators and their food when you're teaching? Is that a concept that's easy to understand? Not when they start. Uh, they've actually got no idea, but in agriculture, they have no idea of agriculture. When they arrive in year seven, it's just completely foreign to them. Nothing about it is um, understood. Very, oh, sorry, very few children do. Some have backyards where their parents have grown food and so forth, but they are rare. So it really is a foreign idea to them. But once they've started to grow their own crops and they get to take home food to show their parents what they've done, then if they haven't worked as well as somebody else, then now they wanna know why didn't theirs work as well? Or if theirs worked better, their friends want to know why it is. And as I was mentioning with the corn, that is just so wonderful to give the idea is it pollinated, you have a kernel, it's excellent. It's not pollinated, it's empty and there's nothing. So that gives them more of an idea about what's happening and how essential pollination is. And then because we've got the other orchards, they know that they have to pollinate for the, um, uh, for the peaches. And we go and we look at it and you can feel the pollen, you can look, do that and the same in the, um, in the corn. The oranges they do, it's not quite as essential, but um, yeah, they end up getting the idea, but, but they get the idea because they're physically able to see it and practice it and then eat it. Just out of a book, it's not as easy for kids. So, so in your curriculum, do you take it from the food? Obviously, there's three dimensions with, with the role of bees for as, as pollinators. It's not just food, it's food security is one of it. It's, it's about biodiversity and then the, the role that that has in, in underpinning ecosystem health. So do you, do you stick it, your curriculum just around the food or is there opportunity to extend it to the ecosystem health through biodiversity as well? Oh, biodiversity is key. It has to be. You can't have something just exist. And, and the kids also understand that in terms of what we're looking for farming to increase that biodiversity so that it's not the monoculture that it was. And, yeah, and that's why we have um, such poor biodiversity and how much it's going to affect us. And so they're fully aware of that side of it. Fantastic. It's so inspiring what you're doing. Um, Yolanda, I've got another question for you, and it's around the, um, there's a question that, that I see that's come up around, is there a good app for um, identifying bees and other insects? And I think that ties into the, should, pe should people be monitoring in their backyard? So, you know, to find out what they've got. So it's a two part question, you know, should people be monitoring? And if, if they are monitoring, what's the best way of going about it? And can you recommend some good apps? That's three parts. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> I think monitoring is so it's so important, and it's like as me myself as a researcher. For a while, people were asking me what I was doing, and I said I was, I'm a professional flower stalker because that's pretty much what I was doing. And there's only so much you can do as one person doing that. So really, getting more, and it ties in also with what Ruby was talking at Robbie was talking about in terms of that educational thing as well. And it's it's exciting. It's a it was so exciting when I was out with a grower and be like, look, this is a native bee that's feeding on one of your native shrubs. They were like, whoa, <laughs> that looks like a wasp. So I think it's increasing that knowledge for ourselves. It's increasing that thing of what are the good flora resources? What are the insects? When it comes to an app, unfortunately, there's no, there's no app for just for bees and it would help you for the identification. Someone was asking before and this is a great, I just pulled it out of my shelf. There is a great book in terms of if, if from Terry Houston, if people want to get some more information on bees. But I guess, and, and we are also now jumping back and should we monitor? We're actually in the process of establishing through bee friendly farming, of establishing a monitoring platform as well of where we will get our participants to go out and we'll come up with a method that's easy for us to use that comes up with some comparable data 
And through that, we're also looking at what's the best way of us sharing that information. And at the moment, I feel like the go-to of iNaturalist or Atlas of Living Australia is where you can upload information and then other people can go in and that are interested and can increase that sort of taxonomic level. So you can put something in that either you don't actually know at all what it is, or you're like, well, I think it's a bee or I think it's a wasp or I think it's a fly. And other people can jump up and then give some opinions on that. And I think it's a really beautiful way then of us all also co collaborating. And I guess it's always that beautiful thing that Fiona often says as well, we're not here to reinvent the wheel. So let's use things that are already working, they're already out there, they're already established, they already have the app platforms, and then we can put our information in that. And then you can also look at, well, you can see the map and you're like, well, I found a read be an axon near and you can see all the other places that was be that was found as well. So I think that would be the go-to things that I see at the moment. But if someone wants to work on a map, eh, on an app, feel free to me. <laughs> <laughs> so if people, um, as one of the activities of Australian Pollinator Week is to partake in a wild pollinator count, and you, there's more information about that on the Australian Pollinator Week website. I don't know if Ange or, or Candice or someone can pop up the link to the Wild Pollinator Count. And, um, but that's something to spend 10 minutes, uh, document what you see and upload the information. So there are ways that you can do that. And I think they do have a, an app for, that they use an app connection for um, iNaturalist where other people will help identify what, what it is that you've found in your garden. Um, I think we're pretty much towards the end. I'd like to just finish with a, a question for each of you, one last question, and that's around if there was one thing that people, that, that one burning thing that you think would really make a difference in people's back gardens to help the bees and encourage a greater diversity of bees in the back garden, what's the action that you would like the people um, to go away and do differently to think about? So for each of you, just one, I'm interested in uh, who wants to start first, go Robbie. No concrete. No concrete. My neighbor can't stand gardening or the lawn or anything and he's just concreting everything. And we already have enough developers that are concreting everything and stopping anything from going into the soil. We do not need any more in our back. Fantastic. So Make Robbie's gonna ban concrete. So that's Robbie's wish. Julian, what's your wish? Yeah, look, I'd agree with Robbie. I think the nesting, particularly in the urban context, nesting resources for the soil nesting bees are really limiting. Um, and it's not just concrete, it's, you know, obviously the, the bitumen roads, um, the, uh, the mulches everywhere, um, these sorts of things. So yeah, making sure there's some exposed soil for soil nesting bees is really important, particularly in the urban context. Fantastic. And Yolanda, what, what do you want people to do? Um, I, I would say grow, grow something that's good for the bees and good for you. <laughs> so grow, grow some, although a lot of them, the things that we know about are introduced plants, but insects still love eating them as well. So, and this could be just some salad and you let it go to flower. It could be, and once you start gardening, and for those of us that know, you will start growing a lot of food and taking up a lot of your lawn. <laughs> and on concrete, you can have it in a container. And the same is with herbs. And herbs are actually really beautiful flowers that a lot of bees, they're good for us and they're good for the, good for the pollinators as well. So I'd say grow, grow something good for both of us. <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. Well, look, thank you all. Thanks for the three speakers that have um, taken their time out on their Saturday to join us and share their wisdom with us um, around uh, bee-friendly gardening. Um, I'd li really like to encourage people to make the most of all of the events that we've got happening throughout Australian Pollinator Week. And of course, it's um, there's so many events all around Australia that that other people uh, are encouraging you to be part of. So take make the most of that opportunity. We would love you to think about becoming part of the Bee Friendly Farming Garden Program. Um, we're really excited to be able to launch that. Um, and so really encourage you to ask more information, um, reach out to us. Uh, and Yolanda is available to help if people are having problems with uh, um, joining Yolanda's emails there, so she's available. So I'd like, uh, Candice, if you can, we're gonna go out with the, the video of some beautiful photographs, the song that you heard at the beginning, but there's some lovely photographs of Australian bees and other pollinators to celebrate Australian Pollinator Week. So thanks everyone for attending. 
And um, Candice, if you can share your screen and give us the video and we'll finish on the video and you can, you can watch it and then finish up when you're ready. Where Grabilias grow and basil blooms, it's pollinator week and it's coming to you. Do they have four wings or do they have two where their eyes are placed? Now that's the real clue. So take a walk, bring a pen when the flowers smell sweet. Who will you meet this pollinator week? We rocket in orbit above the city. Reading the landscape in the language of UV. An aviator asks, Rita, what is it you see? Eucalypts to eat and lantana to sleep. Pollinator, pollinator. Is that a reed me that I see? Pollinator, pollinator. Who will you meet this pollinator week? Suspended midair wearing black and yellow jeans. From aviator goggles observing the scene. Just hold my whole hairs and hover for a bit. Pollinator, pollinator, pollinator. Is that a hoverfly that I see? Pollinator, pollinator, Who will you meet this pollinator week? Wings held up on a piscini as she's perched. Meet Priscilla, queen of the desert. And fell up from buses like a patty puff of straw. With pollen studded roots, she carries on the tour. Pollinator. Veggie growth. Pollinator, pollinator. Is that a paper wasp that I see? Pollinator, pollinator. Who will you meet this pollinator week? Shh, now it's quiet and read is sleeping tight. Mix a drink for sweetness amongst the city lights. Perfumed petals gleaming white as snow. Tempted by the smell. Blinded by the glow. Take to me and you to write the record. Take a walk, bring a pen. 